So uh, on the next panel, we have basics about advanced care with uh, John Broyles from the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care moderating, Dr. Brad Stewart from the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, and Randy Ratkin from the New York Legal Assistance Group. And this is going to talk about some really critical but basic information that I think we all need to have a common shared vocabulary. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, before we start, uh, so th this panel, the intention of this panel, um, as the other one, is, is to be very practical. And, and we're focusing now on the interaction with the health system, um, uh, both before uh, illness, uh, before an advanced or serious illness, um, during and after. And uh, uh, Brad and Randy both bring uh, unique perspectives to this, uh, to this discussion. Um, uh, but before before we get started, uh, I know that Brad, you you, we, you and I huddled quickly before uh, coming up on stage here. Um, you had some remarks uh, based on the, the great discussion that we just had as a segue into this one. And, and Randy, if, if you have remarks, please please share them too. And then um, I, I'm going to open with with some questions for uh, you all as the participants before we start this discussion about the patient, family, family caregiver interaction with the health system. Um, and, and one, one word to the, um, to the panelists, when, when you're uh, in, in the evaluation form that Sarah mentioned, there's a, there's a whole list of um, terms and terminology, advanced, um, advanced directive, palliative care, hospice care. Um, if, if the panelists would uh, define the terms that you're using um, before, before Proceeding, I think that that would be helpful. So, so Brad, uh, your comments, and then Randy. Yeah, thanks much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, uh, a physician uh, times 37 or so years. So we flew in from California last night. Uh, I was really looking forward to this meeting here in New York City uh, with so many um, different. Um, different kinds of people, different faiths, uh, some very strongly held views, uh, and I'm not disappointed. I, I, uh, I want to just remark that as I was sitting, listening to the, particularly the end of the last discussion, uh, as a doctor uh, who's, who's uh, I've done palliative care for maybe 20 years, I've been through a lot of family meetings. Family meetings are where you get to sit and do a lot of listening and, and maybe have something to contribute when people who often have flown in from all over the world uh, have a lot to say about the person who's lying there who may or may not be responding, um, lying in bed, but very near death. And I just want to remark how uh, Similar it felt to be, uh, to listen to the discussion that we just had. And I, I want to just kind of make a quick comparison that uh, so many of the questions about suffering, so many of the um, issues about converting, uh, so many of the uh, issues about belief, um, and, uh, and particularly the, the uh, the imperative that came across to uh, to allow us to, uh, together to come to peace, um, regardless of uh, whether we agree up here or not, uh, is so important in a family meeting. And that as a representative of a large coalition that brings over 100 organizations together around this topic, uh, I just want to appreciate the the um, goodwill and open-heartedness, as well as good thinking uh, that's going into this discussion. What, what I think, now we can segue to what we're here to talk about. Uh, uh, you know, we, we come with, a, with an invitation, an open invitation, to bring uh, all of our ideas and energy together so that those of us who work inside the healthcare system can work uh, can link arms and work with people in the community, uh, particularly around uh, 
people of faith. Because in so many communities, especially the, the more disadvantaged ones, the, the people of faith are some of the, the community leaders. So as we sit here and, you know, in the spirit of family together, um, you know, it would be wonderful to, uh, <clears throat> to continue the, the open dialogue that we just started <clears throat> and really see how we can share in creating a, a larger family and a larger community uh, for this growing population that, uh, that we seek to serve. So I just want to thank everyone for what they've brought and, and hopefully we can continue and even deepen that discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, again, I'm Randy Reckin, I'm Director of Legal Health, which is a division of the New York Legal Assistance Group. And yes, I am a lawyer, and I, I bring sort of the practical aspect uh, to, to this discussion, but I'm so glad I came early. Um, sometimes when I'm invited to these panels, I kind of come and I sit, and you know, I come right at the time I'm supposed to, and I speak and I leave. But I knew this one was special and this one was different and that I wanted to get a sense of who you are, what the discussion was, and how we fit in. And so I am very glad I did because it really gives me a sense of, you know, we're very different kind of lawyers. We are not, we are at the bedside as well. And we'll hear about that when I describe a little bit more about our work. But we are actually lawyers who go to hospice, uh, to hospitals, to home visits, and, and provide services to people at end of life. So this is not sort of a, um, you know, an academic uh, lecture for me. This is very much what we do on a daily basis. And so I really enjoy listening because I feel like in some ways, even though we're lawyers and we're doing practical work, uh, there is an element of what everybody said earlier. Um, and I particularly like the, the last part of the discussion when people talk, uh, I, forgot, I don't know the woman's name, I'm sorry, but who said about, have you done your own advanced directives? How can you carry on this discussion if you haven't done it yourself? And I really thought that, that really resonated. Um, and really what the law is in this area is really about putting into, into sort of written form and legally the wishes of somebody and that could be based on your religion and then you get to this point and this is what your wishes are uh, but it's all about empowerment and putting into place wishes because as somebody mentioned or you mentioned in terms of families you could your whole life believe something it comes to end of life you don't have something written there it goes so it really is about empowerment this area of the law it is about really um you know the, the law is a vehicle in a sense. So I think that's really what I'd like to start with and uh, go from there. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> and thank you, Randy. And um, thank you for the uh, previous, um, uh, to the p previous uh, panel. So it was a great discussion. Um, and I, I wonder if we couldn't continue some of the discussion that we had there. Uh, some of you mentioned um, cases that you're going through now. Uh, as a family caregiver or as uh, dealing directly with patients who are, who are suffering. So um, maybe we could start uh, by doing a quick, a quick uh, census. Uh, how many of you are um, a community spiritual leader or a clergy person? And, and how many chaplains? How many both? Okay. Uh, how many uh, clinicians? Fantastic. Okay, um, and how many of you are dealing with this issue right now um, uh, with a patient or family? How about uh, family caregivers? Wow, so, um, uh, so you guys have your uh, work cut out for you today. Uh, I, I wonder if, if, if we can um, maybe have a few of you talk about uh, what the, the experiences uh, that you're going through now, or a case study that, that um, Randy and Brad might, might react to. They're going to be talking about, um, Randy, the legal uh, um, aspects of uh, advanced care planning, decision making, and the resources that are available, uh, and also the, the financial 
um, aspects of, of care and what resources are available in New York. Brad's going to be talking about um, the system. So uh, what is, uh, what's in the physician and uh, other clinicians' head, heads as they deliver care, uh, the importance of an interprofessional team in, in providing care. This, this is an interfaith uh, group today, and similarly, it, it needs to be um, uh, a team approach on care delivery. And also talking about some of the emerging models of care that we were seeing in other parts of the country here in New York, um, and and how uh, how those models interact with um, the community and how ties can be strengthened between the community and the health system. Uh, but I wonder if, if anyone would would like to uh, share before before we start. Yes, ma'am. I've just been through three months of witnessing a colleague and a friend and his wife who's a friend go through a situation where they did not do the advanced care directive. They did not have the discussion about how serious open heart surgery is. And when it came to the crisis, which was that the surgery did not go well, my colleague and friend spent seven and a half weeks in intensive care, paralyzed, staring at the ceiling, barely able to utter a word or two or nod to his wife. And she experienced the decision of the physicians at the end to say there's no more point in the interventions as killing him. There was, I just witnessed this, I didn't know what to do. It was my boss, so I didn't tell him, hey, get a third and a fourth opinion about how serious this is. Have you done all A, B, and C? He did not even have a, a power of attorney or a health care proxy. How does one handle that? Uh, so Brad, do you want to provide a first response and then read? I'd be glad to defer to you if you can if you have anything to say, because that's, um, there's nothing like jumping straight into the, uh, you know, straight into the fire. Um, the, the, the question is, uh, how does one handle something like that? And there's a lot of ones, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, I guess the first thing to say is, and this is obvious, so I'll just state the obvious, that if, if you, uh, have the uh, ability and willingness to sit down with those that you care about and who care about you and talk these things through and get, get um, I think in, in this state, uh, the, the most form is the one that most people use. Um, you know, prepare the best you can, but uh, you know, people go into things like open heart surgery with high hopes that things will go well, I mean, and, and that they'll come out doing well, and sometimes they don't. And uh, we're getting back into some of the questions we've faced before about, or we've approached it before, about how do you deal with suffering that just doesn't stop? Um, how, what do you do when you're faced with the worst? Um, and sometimes, uh, if you've spent any time in the ICU or, or you know, in the hospital, uh, you've been through a lot where you, you have to wonder, and you'll hear from family, uh, even from patients, uh, that dying quickly might have been easier than this. And so it goes on, and, and there's nothing anyone can do except, and this has come up a lot, uh, except be present. And I, I, I've heard this said a couple of different ways, and it's great that there are so many perspectives on it, because presence, um, and I'm coming from the point of view of someone who tries to, uh, you know, bring healing when, or help, you know, when, when, I, when I can, although I've been through it with my own parents. Um, I think uh, the, the, inter the, the interesting word in the question that you asked is the word do. 
what can what can what can you do? <laughs> and I'm a doctor, uh, you know, I was trained to do, but there are times when doing isn't the answer. There are times when being is the only option. And and um, I'm coming all the way, I'm thinking all the way back to the be the beginning of the day when uh, Rabbi Address talked about, uh, and I, I am not. Jewish or any other particular faith, so I'll just say that I think this, this concept of shalom as peace is interesting because uh, people who are suffering and people who are uh, either expected to die or not, um, we're, we're all heading there. Uh, and maybe the object is to, um, to uh, you know, open our open our whole selves as much as we can, and and the work that we've done with ourselves may prepare us to do that, where we can bring some kind of peace into the room, um, and uh, in the in the face of suffering that's not about to stop, um, I think that's the best doing, maybe that there is. To, to bring to bring that peace into our own hearts because as people I mean we're talking about getting you know approaching the end of life uh, you know if there is any such thing as a good death uh, in, in my experience it's that uh, people and I, I don't just mean the person who's dying but everyone associated um, winds up in a place where they have um, let go. If you're Buddhist, it might be letting go of attachments, or, or even letting go of your of this yourself, uh, because letting go and peace are, you know, you you arrive at peace <clears throat> when you're able to let go. So, uh, being a doer, uh, I've had to work very hard in, in myself to know when to um, stop doing, but not leave. Uh, stay and be and, and so I, I wouldn't I think what we're here from what from SeaTac what we're here to do today is to is to reach out um, from inside healthcare uh, and this is a great place to do it because I don't know if you know the numbers but we are sitting right at ground zero of um, uh, one of the uh, very small parts of the country where people tend to die in hospitals the most. People tend to be in intensive care before they die the most. This is, this is, this truly is um, uh, a very concentrated area of very intensive um, and focused medical treatment in near the end of life. And, and moving moving past that um, is what the rest of the country is beginning to do. Uh, bringing care out of the hospital into the home and community is what we're beginning to do. Bringing care at the end of life um, out of the hospital and into home and community with support is what we're here to, to talk about. So I, I just, I'll stop there, but just to round it out, I think, uh, Faith, however you define it, whether it's faith that's focused on a particular tradition or faith that uh, is a larger faith in our own um, uh, ability and openness to, to live right to the last moment with each other, um, having faith in each other to do that it is, might, might be the the job we're here to look at how we could do together. So I'll, I'll stop there. And, and Randy, you have uh, a PowerPoint. Uh, so just just let, let let us know when, well, if you want to use that. I do, because I am a lawyer and I have a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, and partly because I want to impart some practical advice just in the course of this conversation this presentation and a few minutes earlier, I hear people using the terms and they're, you know, advanced directive, power of attorney, and they're inter they're interchanging these terms in a way that's not right. I mean, I'd like to sort of, and many of you may know this, so I'm, I'm here to give the, a few will the 101 on advanced planning. 
because I, I'd like to make sure we're all on the same page in terms right. of what's out there in terms of making sure the situation that you described doesn't happen. And, um, you know, I always start, and we always start, with the basic concept that people make their own healthcare decisions. Everyone is presumed to be competent and make their own, be able to make their own healthcare decisions until they're not. And then other factors come into play and other advanced directives. And we may not agree with those decisions, and I say we, meaning family, doctors, whomever. And this is true with any decision. You're presumed adult, a competent adults are presumed to make their own health care, own decisions. And we always say in our team meetings when all the lawyers get together and we hear these cases, we can't believe people make these decisions, get into this. And we even say they can even make their own stupid decisions. Right. But people can make their own decisions, and that's really the premise of what all this is about today. I'm not saying stupid, that's just by example of what we talk about sometimes in other situations. But, so let's start with sort of the basics. Um, and, and, and when you're, situ oh, sure. and in your situation, I guess the first question I, I say is where, where is the person in this? Is this person still capable of making their own healthcare decisions? And if they are, they should. It's, your, it's the patient's voice, the person's voice that matters most. Um, and if they're not, we'll get into this, in New York and in every other state, I think except Missouri, I'm not sure, there is surrogate decision making where people are supposed to be making decisions for people, but using what would they have wanted. And there's a whole set of standards, so we'll, we'll get to that about the surrogate decision making. And then finally, if there is a fight among family, and I'm sure you've been at this, all hospitals have ethics committees or committees um, that I know, I have colleagues in the room I know who sit on those committees where these kinds of conversations should be happening with the family. So to your question. Um, quickly, I will start, we'll just skip a lot of slides because I know when we just go. Tell me when. Tell me when. Um, go ahead. Okay, just start here and I'll do this fairly quickly. Yeah. You know, there was an act passed in 1990 called the Patient Self-Determination Act, and that was federal law that basically required all healthcare facilities that serve Medicare and Medicaid patients to ask on admission if the patient has an advanced directive and provide information. Well, let me tell you, in reality, this does, this, they may do that, they may be given it in my, you know, I don't in terms of healthcare colleagues in the room, um, but oftentimes they're just giving it as a form and nobody really sits down, nobody has the time until it really, there is a crisis or an issue, nobody has the time to fill out that. But people are supposed to be giving these healthcare advance directives. Um, I'll skip this. Oh wait, this was interesting and we took this <coughs> what we said before. If everybody has been reading the Times recently, there have been many, many articles on this conversation. And I'm not sure you planned the conversation around that, but it's phenomenal. Just on the 17th, it said the current system is geared, this is the New York Times, the current system is geared toward doing more, more, more. And that system, by definition, is not necessarily consistent with what the patient wants. And then, this is a little bit of an old statistic, but only about 20% of the U.S. adult population has advanced directives. And then they, we did a little research on different populations, um, and you could have that there. So, 20%. Um, and why don't we skip to, to slide seven? Healthcare proxy. I just want to mention that in New York it's called healthcare proxy. But you might also, from other states, might call it an adorable powers for attorney for health care, and there are other names as well. And basically, it allows an agent to make a health care decision for you if you become incapacitated. So again, incapacitated. Can't make these decisions while somebody still has the capability. And again, somebody mentioned you don't need a lawyer to do this. So this is something that everybody could do, should do, and it also goes to don't just do the form, but have the conversation, because it's easy enough to fill out the form, but if you don't really know what somebody wants. And the other thing is, if you do it, make sure that your agent is willing to serve, and make sure that your agent, frankly, people do it, and they don't check it for 10 years, and then where's the agent? Make sure there's an alternate agent. Very practical, just make sure you have that in place. Um, 
the capacity to execute this document and other documents, I may differ with doctors because I say they know what they're doing right here at this moment. They may not know how to function, they, can't, they don't have the capacity to go out in the community and live their life, but they know what they're signing. So we, we've ha often had disagreements with physicians, um, but if they can sign the document, then this is true of all the documents that I will talk about. Um, the role of the agent I, steps right in into the shoes of the person. Oh, I'm sorry, I've skipped to page eight. It's eight, right? Nine. Slide eight. Yeah. And uh, they can do everything that, that the person could be doing, including end of life. Uh, in terms of, this is New York law, very important. If you're filling out a healthcare proxy and you don't mention anything about artificial hydration and nutrition, then the agent cannot act. So it's very important to put that in the proxy itself, or at least to say in the proxy, I've had a conversation with my agent and they know my wishes regarding artificial hydration. What, what does that mean? Does that mean that the, that the proxy is not allowed to discontinue hydration, or that the uh, proxy is not allowed to initiate? Anything, my understanding, and uh, Sheila, if you want to correct me, my understanding is anything to do with artificial hydration and nutrition is the proxy cannot handle unless Any, it's indicated exactly. in the form. Right. So it has to be in the form. Anything to do with artificial hydration and nutrition. Yeah. Even when it's in the form, you have to be right there with the patient. <laughs> because I've had problems yeah. in hospitals where hospital staff come in to give hydration, to give sustenance, and also to use extraordinary means and lie about them. Right. And that is very unsettling. Thank you. Well, the question is culture change. How are you educating people to do what needs to be done? That's the question that we have to look at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't know the you know I would I don't know the answer. How do you get? I mean, it's how do you have people to have these conversations? And how do you have them to have these conversations before it's a crisis? We're always involved when it's a crisis. We're always called at the last minute. Right. So what we try to do, frankly, is if you're coming to us for a housing matter, we'd like to say. Let's do your housing matter, you know, blah, blah, and we go through a whole list of things. And by the way, do you have an advanced directive? So and, we and, and, and the culture, the culture change issue is something that uh, Brad, I hope that you would touch on uh, with the emerging models and um, how oh, clinicians cool. are interacting with clergy and other community members. Yeah, let's. I want to make sure we get to the end of the slide. So. Yeah, that's just, I'm doing it very quickly. This is speed slides here. Uh, living will. People often use that, those terms. And living will is where you actually, this is not appointing an agent. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, this basically is where you put your own wishes in what you want. And it's a little bit like um, having the most conversation, except it's in a document. You know, the most conversation is with the person and the physician for the most part, is that correct? And the living will is where you put your wishes in. And this is, if you have an, a healthcare proxy, maybe you don't necessarily need a living will, but sometimes the living will gives the healthcare agent directive. And also, if you're living alone and you have, I, I, we have so many people who don't have anyone to appoint as an agent, we always say do a living will. And I know that there are these other forms, for example, five wishes. Yeah. Um, we don't do those, but they're perfectly valid in New York. So it's very important this other do this other document as well. If there's especially if there's no one to speak for you as an agent. I mentioned earlier the Family Healthcare Decision Act. Again, every state except I think Missouri, and I'm, I'll check on Missouri, but I don't think so. So this basically, um, if you don't have an agent. That this me and you're in a hospital, a hospice, and a nursing care doesn't count for doctor's offices, and you don't have anyone to make these decisions for you, then there is a surrogate list um, on the next slide, and it empowers family, close friends the, to make decisions. And if, as you can see, the person who's the top of the list is a guardian and <coughs> So this is a very, this, this took 17 years in New York State to pass. 
culture change. So talk about culture change. Seventeen years. So. Um. Surrogate decision making in financial matters. That's a power of attorney. That's page 16. And that is a document where if you don't have the ability, you can't go out and make do your own banking, your own pay your rent, you appoint somebody through a power of attorney. Very important document and very powerful because it goes into effect immediately, not like a healthcare proxy that goes into effect once you don't have um, capacity anymore. This is immediate. You sign it, it's, it's, a, it's a document that goes into effect. Um, can that be changed? Of course. It, you can change it. This has to be notarized, at least in New York, and I, I assume most states, it has to be notarized. And it's fairly, it's, in New York State, it's a complicated, it has become more of a complicated document. It can always be revoked. You can always do a new one. Well, because the, life circumstances change and your agent may change. Members of the both the durable power of attorney, those that are now responsible for the individual, do they have to be consulted when it's changed? Do both parties have to agree to it? Or if there's three or four people on the power? Or who gets to make the decision if, if the person you take care of has dementia and will just say yes to anything they're asked to do? Well, that's a very important question. You know, what's First of all, they have to have capacity and truly understand, even this is a more complicated document than a healthcare proxy, you really have to know, and that's our job, can, does this person have capacity to sign, do they know what they're signing? So there are situations, especially at end of life, I've seen it where people are for, you know, you know we have families come in, the, the adult child says, oh my, my mom wants us to do a power of attorney and name me. And then we go in, she goes, I have no idea what they're talking about. I don't know what this is. So it's very important, you know, to make sure nothing's going on. And if the person doesn't have capacity, we don't do it. And no lawyer should be doing it. But they do. Right? But they shouldn't. It's unethical. Um, with the power of attorney, does it have to be before that person is um, mentally competent mm -hmm. and not after? Because I know that. In certain situations, especially with people with Alzheimer and dementia, it has to be a guardianship and it has to be put in place before that person has been diagnosed with that condition. Yes, absolutely. You have to have capacity. Again, we have situations where we go in the morning, the person has a few hours before they sort of sundown, if you will, and get worse. And if we think they know what they're doing, we may do it, but we have our own assessment. And you're right, if someone doesn't have capacity, you have to have a guardian appointed to do make these financial decisions. Whereas in healthcare, if the person's in a hospital, nursing home, or hospice, the agent can make it, or the surrogate, you know, the surrogate decision making for financial, it's not gonna, you can't. You know? It would be challenged if that person yes. was done because they would not Yes, right absolutely. Okay, I'm almost done here. Um, Palliative Care Information Act just passed in New York in the last few years. Basically, um, it's, and you probably know more about this than I do, but it really is um, one of the few states to say that under, um, to offer terminally ill patients and patients with advanced life limiting illnesses who might benefit from palliative care information and counseling <coughs> regarding end of life. Um, so that was a very important um, uh, change in New York to really encourage palliative care. Two, three more things. Uh, a will, everybody knows about wills, but the thing you don't know about a will and also something else is that we deal with a lot of young parents or parents of minor children who haven't made plans, who are ill, and all of a sudden, they're, who's taking care of their children, especially if they're single? We don't want them going into foster care. They may not be relatives, they may have friends, so that's another part of advanced planning. They should put their wishes in a will or something called, and if you could go to slide 21. For those from, you, from other states, you can see it's called standby designation or standby guardianship. Basically allows a parent to make wishes for their future care and custody of their children without losing any rights now. Very powerful, empowering mm. law. Mm. And 
the two things I thought about in listening to the beginning part of the conversation when I first came in is that there is also something called an affidavit of cremation in New York. So if you want to be cremated, there's an affidavit you can fill out and also a disposition of remains form under New York law. So I thought of those after listening to the conversation earlier. So that is advanced planning very quickly for you. Um, Thanks very much, Randy. And, and uh, many of these forms that you're talking about are considered advanced directives. So the term advanced directives can refer to a living will. It could also refer to designating a healthcare proxy. Is that correct? We like to use the term advanced planning and all the documents, but yeah. it, sometimes advanced directives just mean the health. So we talk about all advanced planning documents to cover everything. Okay, great. Um, Brad. <laughs> Cultural change. Uh, and and could, you, uh, could you also talk about the terms uh, palliative care and hospice and uh, you know, appropriate use of those uh, service lines? Yeah. Well, let me start with those and then we'll get back to the burning question of cultural change. <laughs> um, many of you may already know this, so I'm not going to go into it in huge detail, but there are different kinds of services available to people who are near the end of life. The, the main one in this country that's actually paid for by Medicare is hospice. And I, I know a lot of you work in hospice, so I won't go way into it. But uh, basically hospice um, brings support, um, uh, symptom management, uh, social work services, advice on finances. It, it kind of tries to cover the waterfront. Uh, and often brings it to people's homes when they are terminal. And the terminal technically means that two doctors have agreed, <clears throat> usually it's your own doctor and the medical director of the hospice, that your life expectancy is six months or less, assuming your illness or your condition follows its normal course. The other thing that you have to, so you have to be uh, terminal or, or dying before you can get into hospice. And somebody has to admit it because you have to sign a form. Um, the other thing that uh, hospice requires is that you need to uh, sort of sign away or forego your right to uh, medical treatment that Medicare pays for in order to get on the Medicare hospice benefit. So because of those two requirements, uh, you have to admit you're dying and you're, you have to say no more treatment. Uh, hospice is hard for some people to accept. Um, about 10% of all people who die in the United States today, 40% uh, now of, of people who die in America die on hospice. But 10% of all people who die are on hospice for three days or less because we wait, and when I say we, I mean all of us, <laughs> families, doctors, and we wait until it's so obvious that people are dying that there's nothing else we can pull out of our hat to do, and so off to hospice, and death occurs in, in many cases that I've seen in less than 24 hours. <clears throat> so palliative care has come around the last 15, 20 years to uh, provide a broader kind of support, medical, care, um, advanced care planning to people, ideally earlier in the process, but as those of you who may know, uh, who work in hospitals here, uh, although palliative care has made it into the hospital setting, most large hospitals now have palliative care teams that can see people in the hospital. It hasn't really made it out into the community yet like hospice has. So, um, there are new kinds of care that have developed, and, and now I want to kind of fold in cultural change. Um, and I want, to, <laughs> I want to tell a quick personal story about cultural change. I, I, uh, I give a lot of talks here and there, and I, I keep track of every one of them because I have to send my curriculum vitae, you know, your list of all the stuff that you've done in before people can get credit for doctors to come and have it be official. Um, you know, medical education. So I track them all. I have a CV that is single spaced and I think it's now like 25 pages long. Wow. A lot of talks. I went through it the other day and I went to the last page where my, the first talk I ever gave was, was listed. It was 1983. 
Uh, and those of you, I don't do math in my head very well, so I've worked this out ahead of time. That's 31 years ago. I gave my first talk, and it was called, it was, I did it together with a hospital chaplain who was kind of an activist um, in the town where I practiced, in Sonoma County, California. Uh, it was called Think on These Things. And guess what we talked about? We talked about exactly what we're talking about here today, 31 years ago. We had the same issues, the same questions, the same comments, the same uh, frustration sometimes that doctors were doing, you know, things that people maybe, well, you know. It was very similar to what we're hearing here today, 31 years ago. So have, have we seen cultural change since then? Absolutely, yes. But things have moved forward. Um, do we still need to work together to make sure that there's more awareness? Yes, no question. So, um, I'm just going to mention uh, the kind of I care. Have a question. Oh, sorry. Yes. I have a question. On that policy, on that, on that um, policy of care, I'm finding that most patients' family don't really understand it. And we don't really, as healthcare, we don't really explain it to them. We really don't let the patient family know that once we put them on the drip, that we're hasting them moving off the planet. And I want to know why we don't sit down with the family and do what we're supposed to do. Can I ask where you're from or what you're... Uh I'm you, from you, many different hospitals. Okay, well, you, what's, you, what's, you have a lot, of, you, you have a lot of experience, so what, where are you... 40 years. Of doing what? Of being an RN. Okay, Okay, and, and I'm, I'm very concerned because family members are already distressed. And we know they're distressed. And I'm finding that we're not really telling them about that palliative care. That once we put them on the drip, that that patient is going to move on. Because once they go on the drip, that's it. Okay, why don't, why don't you say what the drip is, and I'll, I'll help define it if you want. And well, it's usually in a it. combination of morphine and whatever other drug they decide to use with that morphine. And I, I, I'm very concerned, because I think that we should be truthful. Patient dying, but maybe they may not die. I've had patients come in that were dying, and with prayer, they left hospitals and live another 15 years. Because the family members didn't put them on the drip. So explain that. So the, the drip to oh, us. Okay. Let's see. I want to hear. If your boy's not lying, go to the microphone. My voice is very Because we all want to hear. We want to hear what you say. I say that the word hasten the death. Can you please explain that? You're telling me that you're thinking that people are hastening the death. You got, yes ma'am, you got doctors sitting there, and that's what it is. Once they go on that trip, <coughs> It slows That's the autonomic the nervous job. system. All the basic functions drop away because. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a lawyer or a judge, but I, I don't have a gavel in my hand. But I am going to say, order in the court. Okay. <laughs> this is very emotional, you know. And uh, after after uh, you know over three decades of dealing with this, I have seen. I have seen, and I have started a lot of drips. For those of you. Who haven't worked in the hospital. Drip means that uh, you have an intravenous access, meaning you got a catheter. It used to be a needle, now it's a plastic catheter in a vein, and you have uh, medication. Normally, we keep the IV open with just saline, you know, water with a little salt in it. So it's like enough like your blood that it just goes in, and we have a flow established, so we have access to your circulation, so we can give you antibiotics or other kinds of medication. Now, in cases where people are um, in severe pain, um, for instance, cancer pain, 
Uh, I've, I've got, give or take, uh, you know, 20 some years experience dealing with cancer pain, the, the worst pain. I mean, you're always surprised, but uh, having seen, you know, uh, about as much pain as you can see in 20 years, I've done a lot of morphine drips myself. Um, I can tell you that uh, in, uh, in my experience and in the, in the medical literature, if you know what you're doing, you can start a morphine drip, control somebody's pain, they'll be totally awake and you won't hasten their death. That's when you're treating pain appropriately. I think you're talking about something else, which is, which oh, is, uh, and, and you're, a, you're a hospital nurse, right? For, I'm, so I'm speaking of palliative care. Not only that, on the article from the New York Times, on December the 27th, 209, <laughs> and the New York Times is a reputable paper. All right, very reputable. Because it was something that I was just quite interested in as being a, a, a pastor and also and going through and a chaplain and going through so much, so much pain and suffering. Pain and suffering. And I was quite surprised myself by the palliative care. And one of the reasons why I'm here today because I figured we was going to have a panel of experts that came in here and was going to deal with it and tell us like it was. And won't go to sugarcoat it, because I think if everybody in here today is a professional in their right, you know, that we have doctors, plenty of doctors in here today. They're not saying anything, but they're medical doctors, I know them. And we're here, want to hear what the experts got to say. And we felt that today, we were going to tell the truth. G-R-U-T-H. Thank you, sir. I, uh, you know, I, I think I hear what you're saying. Okay. And um, I'm a little um, cautious about the word truth, because like we heard at the end of the last panel, and like I've seen in a lot of family meetings where things can get very hot very fast, uh, truth is, you know, one person's truth is another person's, I'm not so sure. So let me tell you what I see as a doctor. And, and I'm sitting right in the middle, like I just said a few minutes ago, I'm sitting right in the middle of, an, of a part of the country where we work very hard to try to save people's lives. We often as doctors, and I've, I've done a lot of this myself in, in my time, we do a lot of things that, that uh, to try as hard as we can to cure someone or keep them alive. And in the process, uh, we may go past the point where what we're doing uh, is actually helping. My experience with palliative care, and having done it for a long time, is that uh, particularly in areas where we do a lot to try to pull people out of the fire, we do everything we can think of and until there is nothing left that we can think of to do, and then we call palliative care. And so what you'll tend to see is palliative care will come in, there's a person there who's suffering and often in pain that hasn't been treated because doctors, like I used to be, I'm an, I'm an internist, I've spent a lot of time in the ICU putting lines in people's jugular veins to give them very powerful drugs to keep their blood pressure up so they wouldn't die. I mean, I know that world. I did it for a long time. Palliative care tends to be called in when all the doctors who put the lines in the neck say, all right, you know, we're at the end of our rope. We've got nothing else to do. So we're going to leave. Basically, I, in my opinion, those doctors are abandoning the patient. And the, then, and only then, will they call palliative care. So you come in as a palliative care doctor, which I am now, and what you have on your hands is a patient and a family who's in an extreme state of PTSD, not just physical pain, uh, emotional and spiritual torment, because they've been told by in, in, uh, in big university hospitals, 15 different doctors 
that there there is hope. We're doing everything we can. We've got one more thing to do. That one more thing gets done. And then the one more thing doesn't work. And nobody ever sat down and said, you know what? It may be that your wife, your husband, your daughter, whoever it is, it may be that they're getting near the end of their life. Doctors don't like to say that. They, <laughs> I have a cartoon that I use in my talks where there's a doctor sitting behind a desk saying to a very thin, ill-looking old man, he said, uh, I've got some bad news for you, so I'm going to call someone who can tell you. <laughs> That's probably not fair. Okay? So when you walk into a room and you see a morphine drip that the palliative care started, I know from my own decades of experience that 9.9 .9 times out of 10, that's happening to someone who needs their suffering relieved. And who caused that suffering? I don't, I don't know who caused the illness. I, I'm not wise enough to know where that comes from. But I do know that we physicians often are guilty of allowing and actually causing suffering that then palliative care gets called in to mop up. So I'm not willing to say that in most cases the morphine drip uh, has been put to end the patient's life. I would defer to the Supreme Court who said a number, a couple of years ago, when they said we do not have a right to die in this country, <laughs> Justice Stevens wrote a, uh, a concurring opinion that said, yeah, right, we don't have a right to kill each other, okay? That's not a right that we have in the United States. It's not a constitutionally guaranteed right to die to be, or to be killed. Uh, now, some states, you can do it yourself, Oregon, Washington, that's legal now, but we cannot kill each other. Then Justice Stevens said, and it's, it's really interesting to read, he said, yes, we do not have the right to kill each other, but he pointed his bony little finger right at doctors, and he said, you have a duty to do better than you're doing about relieving patients' pain and suffering, because you do a terrible job. So. I think what palliative care comes in and does is mop up the mess and count of how many people I've treated with cancer who weigh 60 pounds, who, uh, who uh, are at the end of their lives, the pain or the cancer is into their spinal cord, they have pain that they can't escape until they can't escape it unless they're asleep. So will I help them sleep? Yes, I will. Does that mean that uh, you know they may die sooner? That's not what the science says. When people's pain is relieved, they actually live longer if you study it. Why? Because being in cancer pain that's not treated when we don't do it is the most stressful thing a human being can experience. And I think pain kills people quicker than morphine when you know what you're doing. So. You know, I'm not willing to say what the truth is. I am willing to say that we as human beings need to do whatever we can do to help the suffering be less. And my, what I'm left with as I'm sitting here talking to you and everyone is, I'm really hoping that what I'm saying is, is helping to relieve some of the torment and some of the suffering that we all experience as we agonize over how to care for the sickest and most vulnerable people we know. You know, in our families, as our patients, we do an awful job, I have to say. Uh, speaking of cultural change, we're only beginning to know how to really deal with suffering. We would rather say, hey, there's hope. There's one more thing to do then sit down as physicians and say, we need to talk, okay? I can do this chemotherapy for your mom, but I have to tell you that it, it's probably gonna make her suffer more than it helps her. She is getting close to the end of her life and we need to talk about that. I know too many doctors who will not sit down and say that. That is the problem. So, okay. and, and let me just end. <laughs> Let me just end by saying I really feel for what you're saying. I have been there so often I can't tell you 
where I have agonized over what the, over the right thing to do. And I have done things in order to, to get people out of pain where I've had to help them sleep. And when you sleep, you can't eat. So you gotta sit down and have a long talk with that person and their family. Uh, I treated a man at home one time who had a sar terrible sarcoma that, that attacked something in his chest. And I don't know what it was, but he was in the worst pain I have seen in a long time. He said, please get me out of this pain. His whole family pleaded with me, so I had to bring an IV in and started it at his home. I had him on two different medications. One was a medication like morphine. The other one was a sedative medication to help yeah. him sleep. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's okay. uh, something, it's a second cousin of that. But he had his two teenage sons in bed with him, snuggling with him. And, I, and he said, you know, he could barely talk because he was already pretty sedated. Every time he talked, he screamed. He said to me, his wife said to me, his parents were there, he was only in his 40s, you know. They all said, please keep him from having this pain. And I said back to them, I'm not gonna do this today. I'll give him enough medication to make sure his pain is as good as we can get it. He may wake up screaming tonight, but once I put him on enough medication to make sure he does not wake up and scream, he won't wake up, and he won't die, but he won't be able to eat. So you need to know that that's what's going to happen. Now this guy weighed, he was down to skin and bone, he was very close, but I did not want to make him die. So I said, I'll be back tomorrow morning, and I came back the next day, he was still snuggling with his sons, and they said, we're, this is, we are so sure, all of us, he was still very alert. We are so sure we do not want him to wake up in pain that we want you to help him sleep, even if he can't eat. We know that. So we talked about it for another two hours just to make sure that we didn't, that I didn't cross the line. And then, and then I turned the medication up enough that he slept. And two days later, he died. And he would have anyway a few days after that. But that's what we're, that's the kind of situation we're up against and you just have to think and feel and talk it through, so. Dr. Stewart, you're speaking as a doctor. Can you speak as a spiritual person? Yeah. 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 So, so um, we, we're, we're uh, fast approaching lunch and um, uh, I think we, we have time for uh, maybe two, two or three more questions. And, and then, so this gentleman, sure? this gentleman, and let me, Dr. Okay, and let me, let me throw in one more quick comment, because this is what we're here to talk about. Because it's so hard to have these conversations, to get people talking about the right things, to give the right care, we, uh, a number of us around the country have created a new kind of care that brings these conversations and pain relief to people where they live. And uh, you know we have a care model developed. It involves the community. That's all I'm going to say about it now. But I I do want those of you who have misgivings about the way we're doing things now to know that there are new ways to handle these things. And and by bringing care to the community where people live, we can solve a lot of these problems. And um, we can maybe go into that a little more later. But well, and, and if you don't get your question raised now. Uh, there's going to be a panel after lunch uh, talking about working together. So as Brad said, I, I'm not going to attempt to summarize <laughs> this, this great conversation. Uh, but as Brad, Brad said, um, you know, working together to to relieve suffering, uh, doing what we can to relieve suffering. And and the uh, Dr. Remen uh, said earlier uh, his his idea of suffering is spanning spiritual spirituality, financial and physical and, and psychosocial. Uh, I think is something we, we, is a constant theme throughout the discussion today. So, so Bob Wolf is, is gonna be, is gonna have the job of moderating that panel. So Bob, maybe if we could, we could incorporate some of the questions that don't get raised here into that discussion before we get started. So the, I, think, I think there was a question back there. So this gentleman. Yes, Wait, 
she wants me to use my preacher's voice. Yeah. <laughs> no, you spoke very wisely and for us I heard it so explicitly and it's wonderful how you could lay it out. But can you take the position as a religious, spiritual person and address what you were saying as a doctor? Does it mean a lot for us? Okay. Tyrone, Tyrone's <laughs> over there laughing because <laughs> you probably saw this coming. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I have a lot of friends in the American African Baptist tradition because I, I have a, I, w I would love to be a Baptist preacher. I really would. <laughs> but I, I guess, uh, you know, where, where I've come to as a spiritual person, I, 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 I have to sort of um, agree with uh, the, this point of view that's been expressed by a few people that there's spirituality and there's religion. Um, I want to agree with people who are religious who say that for, for certain people, their faith is the most important thing. It's what atta it's what um, religion comes from. I believe a Latin word that means to bind. And there are some people who are connected or bound to their own faith, and it sustains them no matter what. And I've seen that. It's often enough that where, whenever it happens, I really feel that it's critical to support it. There are other people where faith in a particular tradition isn't at play. It's not there. Um, either they lost it along the way or they never had it or whatever. The, but there's nobody, there's no human being who, 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 isn't, who isn't drinking from a deep well uh, that, or, or doesn't have access. They may have to dip down pretty deep in some cases to, to where the water of life runs through this, in this river through all I think all sentient beings, to quote the Buddhists, um, <clears throat> we all drink from the same spring. And um, in that light, um, and this gets back to the question earlier about what, what, if you're, what if you're in a place where there is just suffering that you cannot do anything about? You just can't. You can't fix it. And believe me, that the, if doctors make one big mistake, it's that it's all it's to always say, "Let's fix this." There are times when you have to just back off and get out of fixing mode. And remember, um, and when I say remember, I mean remember. Get again, once again, you know, drop back, go down deep, uh, and and become a member of the human race together and you know I, I've I've been in situations where all anybody could do was cry there was just such deep grief uh, such uh, there was no, no getting away from no escaping it no fixing it <laughs> and so we had to sit with it and I remember several times feeling um, a very deep kind of joy mixed with the grief, or it wasn't really mixed, it was that they were the same thing. When, when you find, when you dip down deep enough inside yourself, and I think that's very important work that we all could, could do, uh, and you can tap into that, into the water of life, so you're drinking from that spring, the joy and the grief become one. Uh, gr grief is part of life, we're all, I mean, we live, a, we live in a nation of winners, right? You gotta be a winner. Well, I, I'm sorry, but we're all losers at the same time. We're not all winners, we're not all losers, we're both. It's, and you, you can't pull them apart, they're all, it's one thing. So when I think of, as a spiritual person, when I think about peace and letting go, I think, or I don't think, <laughs> I stop thinking, and I feel down deep inside that we are all one, all of us. And, and I am one inside myself. Now, remembering that and becoming a member of that oneness in myself in certain situations takes a tremendous amount of discipline. That's the practice, that kind of discipline. You know, tunneling down to find that spring 
And then when you're with someone who's suffering, every time you touch that place, it becomes easier to get back there. And this, this has been said today too, but when you can sit with someone who's suffering and you are drinking the water from the well of life, that's contagious. It's just as contagious as any, you know, disease except it's good contagious <laughs> because what comes across is without saying a word you know if that guy can sit with this and be okay maybe i can too it's it's like cur that kind of courage is con is contagious it's power but it's not power in the sense of the world or in the sense of medical technology i mean you know let that let that go too the the power is quietness and silence and it and uh, that's where it's it's being in touch with where life comes from so as a spiritual person I'd say that's where whatever I whatever words I'm saying here it happens to be in English it could be in any language uh, it's not I'm not thinking this up it's coming through it's coming from that place but I have to say, I've had to work very hard to find that place. It takes a lot of work. And my partner, who's sitting right there beside you, will tell you how much I have to work at it. She told you already. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure she did. Yeah. So. I, I just want to say uh, one thing, and I'll be very brief. I think uh, the way the doctors come to the point of suspending their judgment, in spite of having some, you know, a difficulty accepting the situation, is a, a remarkable human situation, which connects to the word transform. They don't want to terminate. They want to see if, in spite of suffering, in spite of difficulty in making decisions, can there be another signal, a signal of hope. Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, as a physician, uh, as an oncologist who treats cancer and treated for 30 years and as a past medical director of the hospice, I'd like to talk with you during lunch or after lunch to uh, address some specific questions that you have. A lot of that has already been explained because of situations in each patient. With each patient, the situation is different, and uh, that drip concept that you presented, uh, we can talk more about it, and I think that will clarify. But uh, I think there are also issues here uh, that I'm very passionate about: is the terminology. Palliative care to me is symptom relief. And that does not mean that it has to be done at the end of life. If I'm going for a heart surgery and I'm 40 years old, I need psychosocial support, I need spiritual support, and I need to know that I'll be okay. So besides taking care of my pain and the heart medication, somebody has to come and talk to me and reassure me, hold my hand, and make sure that my family is going to be okay, that I'm going to be okay, that I will not be abandoned, that my pain will be relieved in the hospital, my constipation will be relieved, everything will be done for me. That to me is palliation, symptom relief. Unfortunately, palliation, like we've been talking about, comes three days before death, when the pain is so severe that you need to put somebody to sleep so that they remain pain-free. Pain-free is more important at that time. So hospice care deals with the, the issues about the last six months of life. And sometimes when we talk about end of life, it's really the last few days. So I think terminology and the words we use and the concepts we use are very important. As far as the advanced directives are concerned, we need to address them not when we walk into the hospital. I don't like this federal law because if I'm coming for a bunion surgery, and you, the clerk, ask me, do you have advanced directors? What happens if you die in the hospital? Who's taking care of you? I, I will be very scared, and I will be afraid that I'm coming in for a little hernia or a bunion, and they're talking to me about dying, because that's what the form says about the advanced directive. The time to talk about advanced directives is when I'm young and healthy, probably when I graduate from high school and got the first part behind me. Or, the most importantly, 
is in the houses of worship. And I, as an uh, advocate of advanced directors, will urge you to talk about it at the pulpit, in the mosque, in the synagogue, in the churches, and ask people, have they done their advanced directors? Have they thought about it? Have they talked to their families about it? And that's where you can count on any one of us. And we will come and help in terms of understanding. Forms are very simple. And once we start to do that, I think then always have a copy available. And when the EMS comes, give them a copy. So make sure that they know what your wishes are so that they don't make any mistake in the ambulance or when you walk into the hospital. So these are basic things. But because of the changes in terminology, the way we use our words, and some specific patients in which you've been very disturbed about, I mean, sometimes make us very, very angry and upset. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, Randy, do you have a uh, final? Well, thank you for, for saying that about advanced directives. And I just want to offer um, what my temple did. I worked with them, but they actually sent to every member, and I belong to a huge congregation. They sent a little wallet size advanced directive for everybody to fill out and keep in their wallet. And I thought that was wonderful. And also, there's ways to even register the advanced directive. So um, if you carry around this little card and you don't have your advanced directive, this card will actually pull up in the emergency room, and there is your advanced directive. But I totally agree, the time to do it is before any crisis. And um, I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, how legal work fits in and the only thing I would add to the conversation I really, which you said was so moving, um, is that what we try to do is just give people peace of mind, and as you do, and, and families. So I think while our work is very practical, but it does fit in with this whole notion of giving people empowerment and peace of mind. So. Can I ask a question for Randy? Sure. Hi, Randy. Um, I am the head of a ministry at my church. It's called the Bereavement Ministry, and we provide information for um, getting your physical house in order every year. I'm also a New York State licensed funeral director. And one of the many um, problems that we have in our community, and we're located in Sugar Hill, that's Harlem, um, is that um, people really generally do not open up to receiving the information. We have a lot of elders that are in our community and the legal information that you provided today is so important because I noticed that not only in the church but inside the funeral home when the families come to make arrangements, this information is not known to them and they all have conflicting um, stories on what they believe the person would have wanted in death. So my question more or less is how can we as a group in the church and providing these seminars every year, how can we get out more information to the community? And how can we um, really express to them how important this information is? Absolutely. Um, at New York Legal Assistance Group, where I'm from, we have a separate division called Total Life Choices. And all, their respond all they do is go out into the community to groups like yours to talk about this information, to talk about what the doctor mentioned, to all sorts of groups. So there are, I'd be happy to give you information and we'd be happy to come speak to your church or to whatever group you'd like. But you're absolutely right. It has to be outside of the medical, medical setting. It happens all the time when we mention, oh, you should do a will, and somebody thinks, oh, that means I'm going to die. Or if I do a will, I'm going to die. <laughs> I know the feeling, but you know, I didn't do a will until I, my husband and I were going on, you know, our daughter was very young, and we were going on a trip, and I did a will. Now, why did I wait till then to do it? Because I thought maybe I would die. So we all have our own sort of biases and cultural you know, understanding of these forms. But if the right thing is, is to get it so it's not connected to some triggering event that's going to make people nervous and scared and all sorts of things. So great advice. Thank you. Thank you. And as part of the post-conference um, report, we're going to have uh, the resources listed that Randy mentioned. We're going to have more information about um, the, uh, the resources that Brad mentioned. Um, and so now, uh, Sarah, we're moving on to the pre-launch 